Dear God in heaven, we thank you for your Sabbath day. We thank you for the blessings that we get from it. We thank you we can come together and discuss the lines, discuss the messages that you've given to us, um, help us to wrap our minds around it. Um, been looking at these things for quite some time now. Um, might we get um, an even deeper understanding of them today? And help, uh, I hope it um, triggers um, just more discussion and um, a, a, a renewed um, vigor to look at these lines again and to um, help us understand better where we are exactly on the line and what's ahead of us and what we're walking through. Um, Pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit now um, on me and everyone who's listening. Um, we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I'm going to continue um, the study that I did at the camp um, a from a couple of weeks ago. Now, what I did in that camp presentation was a very, very basic overview. Didn't go into any details. I uh, didn't go into the history really, touched the points here and there. Um, and I guess today I want to fill in some of the gaps um, that I probably didn't have enough time to go into last time. Um, because I just wanted to sort of do an overview. And before I do that, I guess particularly through this history here, um, there's a reason we want to know why the Civil War began in the first place. Um, and the theme of that will carry all the way through. So I think it's important to sort of go back and find out what what caused all this in the first place. And I might, I might just begin, uh, I'm not sure, because I, I don't want to assume everyone's actually um, seen the presentation from a couple of weeks ago, but essentially what we're doing here, we've, this is the lines of the revolutions. What this teaches us is we've got the German revolution, the Russian and the French revolutions, um, and that teaches us and the revolution's coming two parts first part and second part and what it teaches us in the first part is essentially we've got the overthrow of a kingdom a government and the rising up of a dictator on uh, november 9 and so that happened in all these revolutions and that's telling us that this government this because this is a civil war between two sides and essentially by the time we got to 2019 one side had won and a dictator rose then there's a period of preparation i won't say quiet because it, it's never really quiet um, after a revolution and what we see in just about every revolution, because there's two sides back here, the side that loses isn't going to be too pleased. And so they're going to want to fight against the new government and the dictator that rose up. So this counter revolution is in response to um, this government that was overthrown and this dictator rising. And so that's basically what the revolution's uh, teaching us. And there's so much information in these revolutions that you can analyze and, and just sort of bring down to help us really get a really comprehensive picture along here. Um, I might go into a couple of those um, as we go, but again, I'm not going to go into the histories again today, um, but I will go into some history along here. There's been many, many, many presentations on these revolutions and the history and um, what the revolutions were about and who lost and who the dictators were and the counter-revolutions. Um, so we're not going to go into the history today. Um, so the 
if we, I want to go back to the beginning. So what began the revolution? Now, a couple of weeks ago, I would have kept it simple and I would have said um, it was the result of 9-11 that triggered the Iraq war and that polarised people. And then I would have said something like, um, and Fox News was there and that sort of, you know, they became, they were like a propaganda machine and, and I sort of kept it like that. But today I want to go into that a bit more. So I, I didn't explain why, I guess. I just gave you a, a basic overview. So I've got a quote here I want to read. I'm not going to share screen anything today, so I'm just going to read some quotes uh, throughout. And this is the quote. Um, it says, Bush and senior members of his administration, so we're all the way back here. So um, terrorism has occurred and the country is coming to terms with that and now they're trying to project power out in a unipolar fashion um, and trying to get who's responsible for this terrorism. And so that's the context. Bush and senior members of his administration spent more than a year outlining the dangers that they claimed Iraq posed to the United States and its allies. Two of the administration's arguments proved especially powerful. Given the public's mood, now, you can imagine the public mood after the attacks. They want to find who's responsible. First, that Saddam Hussein's regime possessed weapons of max destruction, or WMD, which is a shorthand for nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. And second, that it supported terrorism. Saddam Hussein supported terrorism and had close ties to terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda, which had attacked the US on 9-11. As numerous investigations by independent and governmental uh, commissions subsequently found, there was no factual basis for either of those assertions. Two decades later, debate continues about whether the administration was a victim of flawed intelligence or whether Bush and his senior advisors deliberately misled the public about its weapons of mass destruction's capabilities in particular. Um, so... I'm not sure whether I agree with that last little bit on that quote because uh, we know it's um, this is the beginning of a a civil war, so it's a bit it's it's a fight over narrative. So um, I'm suggesting that the um, they deliberately misled the public. Um, so in the months leading up to the war. Sizable majorities of Americans believed that Iraq either possessed the West weapons of mass destruction or was close to obtaining them, and that Iraq was closely tied to terrorism, and even that Saddam Hussein himself had a role in the 9-11 attacks. So this is the narrative being put forward. Two decades after the war began, a review of Pew Research Center surveys on the war in Iraq shows that support for US military action was built on a found uh, was built on a foundation of falsehoods, so essentially it was all not true. There was no weapons of mass destruction, and Saddam Hussein didn't have anything to do with the terrorism attacks. So, at the beginning of this civil war, uh, we see a narrative built on conspiracy theories, and what that did, it convinced a lot of the country um, as, and what basically as the war progressed, um, support dropped dramatically as, um, you know, as information came out and there was no evidence and they couldn't find um, evidence of what they were uh, asserting. So essentially... The narrative that was used was fear and conspiracy theories. It was a disinformation campaign. And the other thing that it did, 
and I sort of touched on it before, it, it unleashed a unipolar American power in the war in Iraq because if you go back, say, pre-2001, 1989, it was, um, you know, the USSR was um, fallen, um, but through, you know, I, I know the Iraq war was there, but through, um, you know, Bill Clinton and that sort of moving pr towards the year 2000, there wasn't, there was sort of a restraint on, so there was no um, huge amount of power projected from the US because, A, the public didn't really want that to happen. Um, but what happened in 9-11, that triggered such a an outburst um, that it got everyone in in a in a in a line that said yes now we're going to project unipolar power outwards to the world i hope that makes sense and it says here yeah and they had basically congress and the public gave a blank check and unleashed the executive branch and all of the american power that was built up was projected outward <laughs> But not all of America wanted to give that blank check. And so here we start seeing the polarisation. Um, so 2001 triggered partisanship whereby both sides wanted political power, uh, but it happened progressively. So like I said at the beginning, most people are in agreement that, yes, um, we need to deal with this threat. Um But by 2006, the support um, for the war in Iraq was more along party lines. And the suggestion is that the polarisation on the Iraq war by 2006 was uh, so polarised even more so than the Vietnam War. And um, I haven't researched much on the Vietnam War, but I know that it was quite a polarising issue. Um so I've got a quote here. Um, since 2003, social scientists, psychologists and pollsters have been examining false beliefs like Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction and Saddam colluding with Al-Qaeda terrorists. So they're analysing those falsehoods. And why these false beliefs are embraced even in the face of irrefutable evidence and what impact this sort of disinformation has on the political discourse. The resulting research shows that the Iraq war looks like the early version of a current phenomena. Now, this was written in 2014. So what they're saying is um, those falsehoods back in 2000, through this history, the falsehoods uh, look exactly, that, that those falsehoods give birth to what's happening here and I would say all through here. So what happened back here triggered something that carries all the way through. And we're gonna talk about what that is. And this is what it says, the right wing, so I'll, I'll reread I'll re what I just said. The resulting research shows that the Iraq war looks like the early version of the current phenomena. And this is the phenomena. The right wing rooting its stances in simple untruths about the world. Example, see climate change. So here is a quick trip through some of the groundbreaking scholarship on how the Iraq war polarized the US public over the acceptance of basic facts. And then the article goes into the study on the effects of Fox News and how it spreads falsehoods. Um, so basically news, 24 hour news boomed from 2001 onwards and, and terrorism triggered that boom. Um, even though we know Fox News was around since 1996, um, the acceleration and the boom happened at 2001 onwards. 
And so the difference be before 2001 and 2002, you had partisanship back here, but here onwards you had partisanship and but back before then you didn't have these channels um, controlling the narrative to such a degree. So because of that boom, now you've got partisanship and polarization, but on top of that you've got these news channels cycling perpetually um, the narrative. This storm of disinformation really scaled the polar polarization upward. So Fox News drove this polarization by the uh, way it spread information. Okay, I've got another quote here. The degree of factual polarization of Iraq and the role of partisan media outlets, like Fox News in driving it, may have marked the dawn of a new normal Political polarisation has increased the decades since the invasion. And in the past, so, and here's the point, in the past, a divisive event would have occurred, but eventually the two sides would come again and meet and work stuff out. That's sort of how it worked. But from 2001, that can't happen anymore, purely because of pretty well in these news channels. Um, so before then, a, a partisan uh, event would occur, like a, 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 the polar, an event would occur that polarises people, um, but eventually they would work out, come back together and move on and keep doing policy and, and trying to move forward. From 2001, that wasn't possible. <clears throat> Okay, the two, uh, okay, so, so in, the, in the past, a divisive event would occur and eventually two sides would find common ground and come together, but with 24-hour Fox News delivering a perpetual feed of disinformation, common ground cannot be found and the country cannot agree on common facts, and this is the main point. Once Americans become polarised over facts, the damage is done. Okay. I've got a few things to read in the short term. Um, and then we'll... Oh, I've got another thing to read. I've got an article here that Elder Tess um, um, showed to us in one of her presentations. And it's called, um, there is a, a I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it because they sometimes they use swear words in these articles. So it says, how the Iraq war launched the modern era of political lies. I'll just, I've just used lies where they use a different word. So how the Iraq war launched the modern era of political lies. And this is June 25th, 2014. And I'm just going to read the preface. It's only a, and it says, factual divides over whether Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and whether Saddam was working with Osama set the stage for today's battles over reality. And so this is what triggered this war, this civil war. It's the battle over reality. Um, it's information. It's a battle over the narrative. And so what triggered there, we're now trying to come to terms with two sides who are fighting for the reality that they want to say. Um, one in particular doesn't base um, reality on facts. They will use conspiracy theories. Um Okay, and I'm going to read one more thing here. Now, what this is, they did in 2006, the, some political scientists 
they did some studies on exactly what we're talking about. And so I'll read this. In another 2006 study, political scientists Brendan Nguyen and Jason Reifler asked study subjects to read a fake newspaper article about the Iraq war, one that contained a real quotation from George W. Bush from 2004. And this is the quote. There was a real... There was a risk, a real risk that Saddam Hussein would pass weapons or materials or information to terrorist networks. And in the world after September the 11th, that was a risk we could not afford to take. So these words by Bush, the authors noted, may falsely suggest to listeners that Saddam Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction that he could have passed to terrorists after September 11, 2001. Okay, so they've read a false article, but with that quote, which is a true statement that was said. And in the experimental manipulation, some versions of that newspaper article contained a factual rebuttal of Bush's false suggestion. In the form of an end of article correction that cited the release of the Delta report, which documents the lack of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction stockpiles, or an active production program immediately prior to the US invasion. Um, the researchers examined what effect reading the correction had on the participants' beliefs about the Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. And they dis discovered something really surprising. So what they've done, they've basically done a false news article, but they've put a, a, a true George Bush statement in there that sort of leads you to think that there is weapons of mass destruction and we need to deal with it then to work out how that affects people what they did they then put something factual underneath to correct the article saying here's the actual data here's the proof that there was no weapons of mass destruction and they and then this is what they found so essentially, they've got a false article with a true statement that misleads people. And then they've got the evidence at the bo bottom saying, um, no, there wasn't any, and here's all the evidence. So there wasn't any weapons of mass destruction. And then they got people to read it, and this is what they found. <laughs> they discovered a backfire effect among political conservatives. So reading the correction made members of this group, the conservatives, more likely to believe that Iraq actually possessed weapons of mass destruction. So when they read the proof and the evidence thing on the bottom that said there is none, that made them believe even more that there was weapons of mass destruction. Does that make sense? Have I explained that okay? I'll, I'll say it again. So they're doing this study and they, it's an experiment. They're doing this experiment, these researchers, based on how's, how are people believing this falsehood? What's going on here? And so they created an article, false article, but in that article they did a true quote from George W. Bush that said, um, well, I read it to you, it basically suggesting, not saying, but suggesting that the Saddam Hussein does have weapons of mass destruction, all right? However, at the bottom of the article, they're saying, um, they've got all the evidence saying, sorry, this article is not true, and this is the reason. So a false article, but then a true, what do they call it? A true statement or a true... What? fact checking on the bottom saying and giving all the evidence for why. So all the research associated. So opinion, fact, I'll keep it that simple. Fact-based evidence and research, opinion. It's not as simple as that, but I'm just trying to get to the, and what they found was when they even read that bottom factual section, it made conservatives believe even more in the falsehoods and that just and they called it the backfire effect which um i guess 
we could go back to, we could analyse why and we go, well, you know, at the end of the day, if you've got a conservative worldview, you're more inclined to think in, you know, uh, a deep state. So why would you believe in this? Oh, but what about, you know, we've sort of done enough research in this movement to sort of understand the worldview behind that. But to, to even have the facts at the bottom of that article, all the research and the evidence that sort of drives the conservatives to believe in the conspiracy the theories even more. Um, but it goes further. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, so it was called an end of article correction that cited all the evidence of why that is not true. Okay. In a related study, Northwestern University researcher Monica Prasad and her colleagues found similar behaviour um, among partisan Republican voters in Illinois and North Carolina. So similar concept. Presented with evidence suggesting that there was no link between Saddam Hussein and the 9-11 attacks, these voters tended to counter-argue and to double down on their beliefs rather than change their minds or admit error. So once the evidence is there, they would counter-argue and double down. Where have we heard that? Yeah. How many times have we seen double down? Um, so, and here's the point of the article. So was Iraq a turning point for US political irrationality? It's certainly not as though there were no titanic political battles prior to the war that involved disputed facts. So that's the point. So before there, there was titanic issues, all right, that, that involved disputing facts. And that was, and then they're quoting like the Reagan years and, and um, et cetera. Yet the degree of factual polarization over Iraq and the role of partisan media outlets like Fox News in driving it may have marked the dawn of a new normal. Political polarization has increased in the decades since the invasion. The influence of Fox News has also increased as the channel's viewership and revenues have grown since 2002. And disagreements about facts appear to have gotten worse. Um, a 2010 Piper study found that in 2010 election, almost daily Fox News viewers were significantly more likely to believe nine out of 11 false claims, including the assertions that scientists don't agree that climate change is happening, and that most economists have estimated that Obamacare will worsen the deficit, and they'd come up with a couple other examples. Um, Sorry, Brendan. And it, yes. How, how many false claims was that? Did I hear um, So in this study, two, in the 2010 election, almost daily Fox News viewers were significantly more likely to believe nine out of 11 false claims. Are you picking up the numbers? I did hear correctly. There? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nine out of 11, okay. I didn't see that, but we'll keep going. Um, okay. Me meanwhile, in a 2012 survey, Dartmouth politi political scientist Benjamin Valentino found that almost a decade after the Iraq war, 63% of a Republican still believe that the Iraq had a weapons of mass destruction at the time of the US invasion in 2003. Once American, this is the summary point of the whole article. Once Americans become polarized over facts, it seems the damage is done. This is a fight. This is this began the beginning of the end of the fight over the truth. That's what that's what triggered this American Civil War. Um Anyone got any questions there? Uh, I, it's a bit of reading, but I hope everyone gets the point. What what triggered? And nothing's changed, by the way. It was still it was, the battle is still the same. 
Um, okay. Brendan, can I just say something? Yes. You know, when you said 63%, uh, they believe there was a, a weapon of mass destruction. Is that because of facts or they just believe what the leaders were saying? Or that's the narrative uh, that, that the parties was giving, that everybody had to follow? Yeah, they, they believe the narrative that was sold through here to justify mm -hmm. the invasion. Um, and that sort of triggered uh, a methodology of approaching politics um, that you can say falsehoods and get people to believe it. You've just got to you've just got to use enough fear to motivate that group to do that. And the fear was there because it was terrorism. Okay, so thank you. Yes, Lynn. Oh, something, yeah. Um, it just occurs to me that um, basically human nature, if you want to call it that, um, once they've made up their mind, they're reluctant to change it, even with the presentation of facts, because they just would rather prove they were right in the first place. So I think that just highlights that maybe not so positive characteristic. Irrefutable, irrefutable yeah. evidence it's can kind be of placed and it won't make a difference. Which is pretty scary. And the, the studies show that not only is it just the, the argue back, but it's the double down. And that's the method of we've seen time and time and time and time again. Yeah. Lie um, and double down on that lie. I was, I was thinking on that too. Do you think it's pride or um, laziness or both <laughs> other things? I think it goes back to our worldviews. So why would, why would people in that study looking at that news article, why would they believe that bit and not the data-based evidence? Because if, if you're a right-wing conservative, your worldview is well, how can you even trust that there's people in the background pulling strings doing something with that data? So, um, you know, you, when you see nine, uh, the terrorist attacks, you have fear. Um, someone's got to pay. Um, yeah. So I, I think it goes back to our worldview. I, I, don't, I don't know... Maybe what you're saying is valid as well. I just, I, it just makes me go back to our worldview and why you would believe something and not something else. Well, uh, Brendan, I just yeah. uh, watched um, a while back, watched a program about um, conspiracy theories and how um, they were explaining how people that believe conspiracy theories, um, how the mind plays, um, you know, it's, it becomes delusional. So, they explained how that they they have their will view as you as you're saying, and so everything that happens politically and externally, they place that within that will view. So they've already set that up to have that fulfilment of that will view. So um, it it becomes like delusional. So I just thought that was interesting at the time, the way they explained it. Another word for that would be the rabbit hole. Some people use that language. Um, once you've got that worldview, once you adopt one conspiracy theory, it's hard not to grab all of them. And once you're confronted with them, you sort of you end up adopting a lot more that you wouldn't think you would have. And before you know it, you're alienating your family and you're, you're saying crazy things. But And I, I think another word for it is predicting... It's sort of like they've got that, that end picture of what's going to happen. So everything that does happen is is put into that that um that mind frame. So they're sort of predicting that that's going to happen. So then if this happens, that has to be leading on to that, that end, that end. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
it brings us back to the Ramsey theory. When they start seeing patterns or perceived patterns, well, it has to mean something and therefore that equals that. And so you've got your end story of what they, and they're just finding patterns and making it all fit together. And there's always breakdowns though. <laughs> yeah. Brendan, is this the same also uh, during the condition, you know, when Pilate was announcing that he find no faults in Christ and the people already make up their minds. They make up their decision already based on a lie, based on the narratives that the hybrids was given them. And it didn't change their mind, even though the high God, you know, the ruler decided there was no faults in him at all. Yet they wanted to crucify him. Yeah, there might be there might be something to that. You might have to look at that more, Molly. That might that sounds interesting. Yeah. Has anyone got? Yeah. When you receive a message and Rabbit. you study it and you go over it again in your mind and you share it and you write it down it becomes fixed in the mind and pride puffs up. And sometimes when the truth comes over, all of the pride, the sharing, the, um, you know, the, the embedded message in the mind, the pride surfaces and it over, <laughs> overshadows the light. So you can't embrace the light. Just the, the way the mind in a human being uses its mind. Just like when this message comes over, many uh, people out there in, in, in Adventism uh, believed uh, uh, a certain uh, way, they will find it very, very difficult to make the changes. Yeah. Thank you, Josephine. That was... Um... That added good value. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. As I'll, I'll move on. Um, no, you, you can. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, okay, so back to the Civil War. Um, so essentially, the Civil War was triggered by 9-11. And it ends on eleven nine. Whose message was that? <laughs> Whose message was that? No, no. <laughs> Michael. Michael Moore. Okay, so Michael Moore's documentary was a warning message of basically this story. Um, and so Fahrenheit 9-11 marks the beginning of the revolution and Fahrenheit 11-9 marks the end portion of the revolution. And I say it that way for the following reason. So whether it's Michael Moore or Time Magazine and the historians in Time Magazine, um, and that Time Magazine, I think, triggered the study of these revolutions in the first place with Elder Tess or, or it helped her un bring some of this together so and what the time magazine historians identified november 9 2016 here yeah, um that that's when they identified oh that that's the same as the german revolution oh so that's um you know essentially they identified it not just there but also Hitler is marked there as well. So they, they basically say, oh, this is the rise of Hitler, um, et cetera, et cetera. And Michael Moore basically is saying the same thing. Now, they're saying it here, 2016. Now, we can mark uh, a dictator at 2016. What study do I use to do that? Put your thinking caps on. Study, the Battle of Ipsus, we can see a, a dictator there. So, yes. Um but what Michael Moore and Time Magazine, they don't have the prophetic lens that we do. And so we see the end of the revolution, uh, November 9, 2019, whereas they would see 
oh, look, America's just been overturned in November 9, 2016. So they're saying the same thing, um, but they don't have this prophetic lens of the revolutions. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're seeing a rise of a dictator in here and here because we've got another study to tell us that. Um, but they're, I guess, Nethanims, they're a bit more limited on their prophetic lens. They've just got um, events and history to go by without this methodology specifically. Um, so what do we see on November 9, 2019? Now, I want to separate November 9, 2019 from the year 2019. Um, and this is sort of something Elder Tess has tried to stress to us quite a few times. There's, there's a, a, a day and a date, but then there's a year. And depending on the story you're telling, you can't, you've got to not try and mix them. So some people would say, FFA would say, I mean, they, they did made some accusations back then saying, oh, yeah, but there was no impeachment on November 9, 2019. Um, so if we were just to address that as an example, um, we would say in uh, 1868, 151 years brings us to 2019. Okay, that's fine. So in 1868, we've got an impeachment of Andrew Johnson. And in 2019, we had an impeachment of Donald Trump. Andrew Johnson was, he got in trouble because he fired someone he shouldn't have and he misused his power as president. And he followed the South. He was for slavery. So moving forward, we have Donald Trump who was impeached. Um, so he fired someone he shouldn't have. Who, who was the person he fired that he shouldn't have? Does anyone remember? James Comey. Everyone remember that? No. Um, And he misused his political power or his power as president um, by getting Zelensky to investigate his political opponent. Um, also, he wanted to get rid of Comey because um, of the investigation into Russian collusion with the Trump campaign. So there's so many... Every time you look, I look at these lines, there's so many, it's like a web. You look at one line and they just link into everything else. So even if I, if I took a step back for a second and I said, let's go back to here for a second and I'll come back to there. At the beginning of the American Civil War, you had the executive branch was against Robert Mueller and James Comey. Does everyone remember that way back here at the beginning? Executive branch would basically attack them. They had to come to They're basically the heart of the establishment. What was the word that we, we were using the other week? Elder Palminder was using. Um, civil yeah, they're civil service. Civil they're service. The, yeah. They're the ones that, they're the hard ones to overthrow, yeah? But what's interesting is back here, the executive branch were trying to take down. You had Robert Mueller there and James Comey. And then what did you end up having at the end of the American Civil War? You had the executive branch again going after James Comey and Robert Mueller. The Mueller report and James Comey because of collusion, the investigation. Um, but you can see the narrative was sort of, the Mueller report was 
whitewashed. Bill Barr just sort of steamrolled over that and kept the narrative going for right wing. Um, so essentially, like at the beginning, they were sort of that, those two stopped it. But by the time you got to the end, they got a bit railroaded. Um, so there's just an example of at, at the beginning and the end, you've got two characters in the civil service who stopped it here, but started unraveling here. They didn't quite, they didn't quite stop it. Um, Comey got sacked and Robert Mueller's report just sort of, well, Bill Barr did his best to make it appear that wasn't that bad. But anyway, anyway, back to impeachment. Um, so again, three years before that, um, 1865, which again is the end of the American civil war here. <laughs> um, but 1865, the actual American civil war, not the, um, the application. You end up having um, a change from Lincoln to Andrew Johnson. So a president that freed slaves to a president that was for slavery. And so, you know, three years before here, you've got Obama to Trump, a president that was for equality to someone who fights against equality. Um, and that's, Basically, the consequence of this story is you've got a dictatorship who fights against equality. And that's why you end up with Black Lives Matter um, and the Me Too movement, et cetera, et cetera, who are fighting against this setup. Um, the point here is did the impeachment here happened on November 9, 19, uh, 1868. No, it didn't. So why are we expecting to see an impeachment here on November 9, 2019? Uh, here's an example of the difference between the day and something that happens during the year. Um, so there's no link with November 9 and impeachment. However, it's still part of the story of unrestraining a dictator. I'd just like to remind us because that impeaching Trump here, he wasn't convicted. And that was another step of his unrestraining going into a new form of dictatorship. Um, mm. I've got something here. I guess there are many steps along the path and we go to Putin as an example. There is a many steps along Putin's path as he marched towards, um, you know, becoming authoritarian. So there's heaps of steps. It's hard to tell at what point in the information age when a dictator becomes a dictator. So um, the courts are still in place. The Supreme Court's still there. The constitution's still there, the institutions, et cetera, et cetera. They just sort of get twisted over time. Um, but the point is you could argue at every step that you see a dictator. So what is November 9, 2019? So if we go to World War One and World War Two, how many fronts do they exist on? And we touched on this a couple of weeks ago. We go to World War One and Two. There's an East and the Western Front. It's that time. Okay. East and the Western Front.
So who's fighting on the Eastern front? And, okay. And who's fighting on the Western front? Versus the West. Who's in the West? The USA. Okay. Makes sense. Yep. Who's in the West? Americans. So, and made the point last couple of weeks ago, well, what's the USA versus the USA? Sure. The Civil War, the revolution. Um, so when we talk about revolutions, are we talking about the Eastern Front or the Western Front? Western Front. Everyone okay with that? The revolutions are a country fighting itself. All right. That's not a country fighting itself. So the Western Front, uh, the studies of the revolutions, gives us information regarding the Western Front of World War Three, which is internal to the United States. So November 9 is specifically a Western Front subject, okay? It's got nothing to do with here. It's a Western Front subject, November 9. Um, however, everyone says raffia. Why is everyone saying raffia for here? What subject is raffia? Is it Western or Eastern Front? Raffia, let's go back to the original Raffia. What was Raffia a fight over? Babylon and Egypt over Col Syria, Col Syria in the middle. Jeez. Yeah, and and that was a fight over, um, you know, Col Syria was a place of strategic importance in the old world. And um, so which front is that? You've got Babylon versus... Egypt, you got, so that's Eastern Front subject. So Raffia is Eastern Front. Um, it's Russia versus the USA over spe spheres of influence. And we're scratching our brains going back now because this, none of us have probably looked at this for a little while. But it's important to separate this date to the year. The year is a subject of the Eastern Front and impeachment and but the this moment is about internal to the united states now i'm going to throw that on its head and confuse everyone all right so now it gets complicated um and for this reason i'll draw i might draw this as i go actually probably wondering why I'm saying all this. We'll get there, hopefully. So we'll go back to here. So we've got East and we've got the Western Front and we've got Russia versus USA. And we'll just say USA versus West, which is USA. Okay. <clears throat> So if I go to Daniel 1140, November 9, 1989, what's that described as? Can someone tell me off the top of their head just what that verse says? King of the South receives the deadly wound. Yeah, so just what's it? What is it? It's like the king of the north goes against king of the south, like a whirlwind. And basically, what is that? It's a battle. You, yeah, we okay with that? Um, it's a it's described there as a battle because the king of the north has lots of 
stuff with it that can take down the you know it's it's got um it's described as a battle so this is november 9 1989 so november 9 1989 was a battle that ended in revolution why am i saying that so on November 9, 1989, was the battle between the USSR and the USA. Did anyone see the USA on November 9, 1989? Not really? It's the Berlin Wall. So who pulled the Berlin Wall down? Germany. People. <laughs> so why would the people pull its own wall down? What do you call that? Revolution. Yeah. So November 9, 1989. Republicans need to use the microphone. Okay. Thank you. So, if you, yeah, everyone heard that. Um, so, November 9, 1989, you couldn't see America there at all. What did you see? If you were living in Russia, uh, USSR at that time, what would you be seeing? its own people pulling down its government, all right, which is, okay. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says the king of the north takes down the USSR. Um, so without me without people realising it, what's the difficult issue that we've just found ourselves in with me just saying that? What have I just said? What problem have I just caused? Because I've just said that the revolution hit November 9, 2019 is a subject of USA versus USA. But when you go to the primary November 9 way mark that's associated with this, Um, what does the Bible say? It's saying it's actually Eastern Front issue. Mm -hmm. Has everyone got that? Okay, so the revolutions is a Western Front issue, but when you go back to the original beginning of our reform line, November 9, 1989, is a Eastern Front issue. Can anyone Has anyone got an... Uh, can anyone explain why or get out get a way out of this? Has anyone got a way out of that? You said the fall of the King of the South. Yep. So do you understand what the problem is, Molly? With I've just said that this is the subject of the Western Front. America versus America. But when I go to November 9, 1989. It's actually an Eastern Front issue. So you're talking about the difference between the date and the year. So one's a year thing because you mentioned before that one was East, an Eastern Front and the other was a Western Front. Yeah. So is that what you're referring to? Um, I don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, maybe I am. I'm. I'm. I'm getting my head around this. I, I'm. Tr I'm trying to explain it the best I can. Um, okay. I thought that when the Russian and, and Sunday law come, both the king of the south and the king of the north, they both fall. I thought that's what you're relating to. Yes, we're going to get there. Yes, oh. that's right. <laughs> So that's that's here, from here to here. Okay. You're ahead of us. <laughs> so you're talking about the deadly wound and the death of the King of the South. Yeah. Which is part of this story. Yes, that's okay. right. Um, I'm trying to get there, though. So... Um, Do 
Okay. Just bear with me for a second. Okay, so we'll, 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 I'll just rephrase it again. So in November 9, 1989, we have an internal revolution where within the USSR, the people pulled down its own wall. We know that Daniel 1140 says it's actually the King of the North had something to do with that. And so we know that for the 10 plus years prior to that, that um, America was deeply involved in undermining um, and bringing about the circumstances whereby the people within the USSR would actually be in a place to pull down that government. Um, Excuse me, Brendan. Yes. Wasn't Gorbachev seeking Europe's help to pull down the wall? Wasn't he in collusion with them? Uh, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we've looked at, as a movement, we've looked at November 9, 1989 quite a bit and the reasons, I mean, I've got a number of reasons why that happened, um, but I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Well, just that he was looking at trying to be part of the UN. Um I thought that was the Iron Curtain and I thought the breach happened before November 9 down in one of the other countries. Um, I can't remember the day. I think it was September 11, something. the previous year or something like that. I can't remember what country, but that was a breach and they were trying to... So it was progressive. I don't know about that, but I know that the picnic of something, we need to refresh ourselves. But it was an iron curtain. Uh, I, I, I know that they wanted to be a part of the UN after that when it fell because they didn't want a unipolar world driven by America. I'm not sure about before that. I thought they were just trying to keep the iron curtain in place because a government doesn't want to pull itself down. I wouldn't have thought. Um, so November 9, 2019, do you see, I, okay, here's my point. I'll, I'll, I'll move on so we can get to the point. So in November 9, 1989, you couldn't see America anywhere, but you know they were involved in bringing about that situation. So November 9, 2019, do you see Russia anywhere? Oh. What do we see in an information age? The USA's own people are pulling down the government, internal infighting that overthrows the government. Yeah. So, but was Russia instrumental in helping the cause to cause that internal infighting? Absolutely. Yes. So here's the point. Um, disinformation campaigns, internet research agency, helping Trump get elected, collusion. If it wasn't for Russia, this wouldn't have happened. So the point is, it is the same as November 9, 1989. Um, so let's be Putin for a minute. You see the, so you experience 1989, you see the Soviet Union crumble because of the USA and how they manipulated events around the USSR to bring it to a place whereby its citizens rose up and tore down the USSR itself. Um, Putin lived that then. He saw Libya with Gaddafi, um, Putin's ally, a sphere of influence for him. Libya, which is like the uh, soft underbelly of NATO. So it was very, very strong strategic position for Russia. You're at the bottom of Europe. So it's like the soft, and that's what caused 
1979 with the um, USSR, the, uh, the war in Afghanistan. It was called the soft underbelly of the USSR. That's what was so strategically important. It was right underneath them. And Libya is the same for NATO from Putin's perspective. So he wants the soft underbelly of Europe, of NATO. So that's why it's strategically important. But what happened with Libya and Gaddafi? CIA went in there and Hillary Clinton was a part of that. Um, and so essentially America went in there and caused regime change. So America, their methodology, they go in and bring about circumstances to cause regime change from within side bringing themselves down. And so Putin, then Putin saw when he wanted to run in again in 2011, we might remember this, when he wanted to go again as president, there was all these demonstrations, the people rose up. Um, Putin blamed the US for that, not because he was basically people saying, we don't want you to run again, you're being a dictator now, come on. He saw that... Um, the population rising up and all the demonstrations, he saw that as US, uh, US involvement trying to bring down his regime. Um, also, the Arab Spring was happening. So he saw protesters everywhere. Um, so he saw 1989, he saw Libya, Arab Spring within his own country. And what he did... Um, and those, uh, the Arab Spring protests, a lot of those were his spheres of influence as well. Um, so who does he blame for all of that? The USA. And so they're the one trying to bring about another 1989 or regime change from the inside. And so what does Putin want to do? He wants to do the USA what he believes the USA has done to him. And what does that look like? He wants to create regime change within the USA, whereby the USA pulls itself down. Does that make sense? He's just, he's tit for tat, we'll call it that. Um, so what he's going to do, he's going to manipulate events around the USA to bring it to a place whereby its citizens rise up and tear itself down from the inside. So he created the IRA, he helped Trump get elected, disinformation campaigns against Hillary Clinton and all that. Um, so I've gone through all that just to say November 9, 2019 is war on the Western Front, but Russia is also a part of that story. So you need to see both to get the whole picture. Um, so November 9, 1989, it looked like the King of the South was in revolution and took itself down. But the king of the north was there beforehand, and the Bible sees that as the battle, even though it was revolution. The Bible says, no, the king of the north brought the king of the south down. Um, so the Western Front is correct, but you need to see both perspectives. And I'm just going to read a quick summary of what I just said then. Um, essentially, it's... Trump was elected with the help of Putin. So one perspective is the USA versus the USA. Another perspective is the USA versus USA, but King of the South has had involvement in that. So King of the South versus King of the North to bring down the government's establishment, but you need both perspectives. So you need the Western Front is saying yes, correct, but it's also the Eastern Front is also correct. Does that make sense? But the, 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 the main difference I just want you to see is, yes, it's, it's Western Front and Eastern Front. But when it comes to... Um, the main difference is you've got to see the separation between what's happening internally and the, what's happening externally with spheres of influence. 
Okay, so all this is subjects of internal, whether it's internal within the USSR, internal with America, we're not talking, whereas Eastern Front is predominantly about spheres of influence and raffia is spheres of influence. Um, okay, I was very nervous about going through that because it's quite difficult to navigate that and I'm sure... I've probably confused people, but we'll keep going. What's that called, Brendan? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've been called. Caught. What's the word? Qualifying. Yeah, stop. Okay. <laughs> it's very good. Thank you. We'll edit that bit out. Okay. All right. So I will touch a bit of history here. Um, so just while we're here, before we go into the counter-revolution, I just found something that was interesting um, in the Russian Revolution. So uh, we may remember that what marks, um, I think it was the storming of the Winter Palace the day before, but then Lenin did his decree on the press on November 9, 1917. Um, what happened here, all right, in this history was um, the country held its first ever and last free elections in Russian history. So everyone could vote. Um, and what what happened here, the Bolsheviks were winners in the urban areas. Um, but the Socialist Revolutionary Party topped the polls, uh, winning on the back of the country's poorer rural, rural areas, and they defeated the Bolsheviks. However, no party won the majority. Um, and so I think the Socialist Revolutionaries got 40.4% of the vote. The Bolsheviks only got 24%. And then the balance of, there was lots of different parties, the balance had the rest. There was lots of different groups. Um, so essentially, the Bolsheviks didn't win the popular vote. All right. They didn't have enough to get majority, but the popular vote went to the socialist revolutionaries. And... Um, what ended up happening and Lenin, because he lost, he claimed that there was issues with the votes <laughs> and it was rigged. Um, so there's no, nothing's new under the sun. And what ended up happening as a result of that, um, the elections did not produce a democratically elected government. Subsequently, um, the Constituent Assembly was disbanded and the Bolsheviks proceeded to rule the country as a one-party state with all other opposition parties banned. So when you hear something like that, where the popular vote won and yet the Bolsheviks sort of, it's rigged, the election's rigged, um, they disbanded every other party it's more complicated than that, but I just want to keep it simple. And as a result, you wonder why there was a like you wonder why there's a counter revolution when action there's a, a an election um, and then they basically disbanded all other political parties. They didn't even get the popular vote because it was rigged. Um, you wonder why there's a counter revolution. Um, it has to be a counter-revolution. You can't have the Bolsheviks do what they did without consequence. So I just find it interesting during this history here, we have an election, we have a dictator, and we have him saying that the election that he lost is rigged. Um, um, yeah, first and last um, free, and free elections at Russia 
has had. I'm not saying it perfectly lines up with anything. I just, I think just the model of dictatorship, they're just cut from the same cookie, same cloth, we'll go with that. Um, so this brings us to the counter-revolution. So remember, this is the movement that rises up um, against the dictatorship that was set up between here and here. Um, and so this was triggered by the shot that was heard around the world, which was the death of George Floyd. He said, I can't breathe. That went around the world, just like the shot at Lexington and Concord. Um, that shot went around the world and that united all the people in the colonies against, we'll say, the dictator of uh, England um, bearing down on them. So that united that group of people, just like um, this, um, this united, this counter-revolution against this dictatorship. What's interesting is, you know, the impeachment didn't unite you know, the impeachment in this history didn't unite the world, let alone the Democrats, to bring about the counter-revolution. Um, but the death of George Floyd did unite um, the movement to fight against it. Um, okay. Nearly there. Okay. Okay. I just want to remind us how we got 2021. Does any, ever, anyone remember and want to have a go at how we got 2021? I'll, I'll go slowly. It, it, it takes a bit to get to it, but we've sort of talked about it partly. Brendan, so, can I please ask yes. a question? I'm sorry, yes. just before you go on, um, just the George Floyd, just how is that connected to um the counter? Like I I know that our our chair said that that was the counter evolution. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I should have asked this question way back then. But I'm just wondering how is it connected because. The, the counter-revolution is connected to the rising up against the far right and Donald Trump representing that. That's correct, isn't it? So yes. George George Floyd, that was just the that was the police force um that was corrupt, wasn't it? That had been like for a long, long, long time corrupt. But so how does what's the actual pinpointed connection? I I'm sort of I can only see it generalised. I can't see anything pinpointed. Does that so make sense? Que yeah, your question is, how is this a counter-revolution? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So with this dictatorship, this government that was overthrown, essentially we're talking about um, in an information age, which is hard to see, but people see it, you're dealing with a regime that is against equality. Um, people know that, especially if you are on the other side, of if you're opposing right wing, you know that they are against equality just by their what they do. So when, when we, there needs to be a flashpoint that triggers something just like Lexington Concord, there was a flashpoint. There was heaps of shots happened before that one at Lexington and Concord. There was, there was a massacre in Boston and like there's a, there's quite a few guns going off, but there were on this particular occasion, People said, that's it, I've had enough. Back in Lexington and Concord, back in the Re American Revolution, they said, that's it, it united everyone as a united front to now. And that, that's what triggered the American Revolution. So I haven't done it this time, but 
I could I could say as 2020 I could go okay let me rub this out if I grab the priest's line and overlaid it here This is close of probation on the police line, and this is um, second advent. Do you agree with that, Marie? I'm only just grabbing. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah, grabbing no, the no. harvest. Mm. This this is just the yeah. harvest of the priest line. Yeah. So we've got a Boston, Concord, Exeter, test. Um. So on Concord. Um, we have 2020. It's not just Concord, it's also a death decree. And that's why we see George Floyd that triggers a series of um, deaths that were really devastating to the, the a revolution that are fighting for equality. They lost a bunch of champions here that were advocates for equality. But so on Concord, we have... 2020, May 25th, George Floyd. If I go two, four, five years back, it brings us to the beginning of the Civil War, which, oh, what date is it? It's um, uh, 1775, I think. And that, bring, that brings us to Lexington and Concord. So... If you go back and use methodology, it brings us to the beginning of the um, American Revolution. And when you bring it forward, that shot heard around the world with George Floyd when he said, I can't breathe. There was that event caused a global movement. Um, unlike we haven't seen where the movement was Black Lives Matter. It was the Me Too movement. They united and came together to fight against that. So this marks the beginning of the American Revolution, which is Lexington and Concord, which is marked by the priest line, but also 245 years back, we brings us to the beginning of the American Revolution, which tells us this is the beginning of the American Revolution. There's nothing else that happened in that year that united such a movement that brought about a, a, a movement that was to fight against that that move that what was set up here mm. thanks for explaining it so well I appreciate that I haven't I didn't draw any of this because I've done it a few couple of times before but I I um I normally do it a bit better than that but the American Revolution is 1775, the beginning of it, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. 1776. I'm going off my memory here. So, um, 1776, April 19, I'm pretty sure. I've got here April 19, 1775. Okay. Happy to be corrected. I might have some wrong notes here. But yeah, so, and do you understand where we get the 245 from, Marie? Oh, I actually, I can't remember. Okay, I'll do it. I'll just do mm. it here. So, thank you. We've got the 2520. We can, bro we can split that into two 1260s, yeah? Yeah. Well, we can do that with the 490 as well. Two four five. Four ninety is the same thing. So mm -hmm. if we go two forty five back, it brings us to the very the moment the American Revolution begins, which in application is the moment that the American Revolution begins in our history, and it's marked by Lexington and Concord, um, which is a shot heard around the world that that united the people, the colonies against a dictatorial Britain or England. 
So this is marking a um, a movement that was united because of I Can't Breathe that shot around the world um, mm -hmm. and united a movement against, I'm going to say, this dictatorial government, but it, it's it's a global thing we're talking about now. So it's whoever agrees with that, um, worldview. Okay, is that okay? Can I? Yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate it. That's pretty in incredible. So thanks. <clears throat> okay, I've got a couple minutes. Um, I might just bring this. Um, I'll do this very briefly. So the study, we want to get 2021. The study on revolutions is what in World War Three? Uh, it's it's Eastern Front, Western Front. We've we've de dealt with that. So Eastern Front, United States versus Russia. Western Front is USA versus USA. So the point here is, um, when does the Eastern Front end? World War Two. It's the same time as the. Western Front. Eastern Front ends at the same time as the Western Front. If you're Germany and you're looking at your Western Front and you're looking at Eastern Front and they're bearing down on Berlin, 1945, ends at the same time. Western Front ends the same as Eastern Front. So in application, when does the Eastern Front end is the question. And that goes back to what you were saying, Molly. When's the Eastern Front end? When does Russia... 2021? Yeah, it gets its uh, deadly wound at 2021. So if Russia gets its deadly wound at 2021, what else gets its deadly wound on the Western Front? The West. That, isn't it? Yeah, the West. The USA also gets a deadly wound at 2021. So on the Western Front, you can see a deadly wound just as well as you can see now I'm gonna have to rub just I've got a couple more minutes and then I'll close so just bear with me okay Let's just draw. Some other things that are going on here. So we've already discussed about the Eastern Front, which is um, King of the South, King of the South. Deadly wound and death, but we're also dealing with the counter-revolution, which has a, let's just call it the USA for the moment, has a deadly wound <coughs> and a death. What does that top one look like? Maybe I'll call it the counter-revolution. What does that look like? Does it does it remind anyone of anything? 
that top one. Acts 27. So what's Acts 27 say? So we've got Cyprus. I'll just do it on here. We've got Cyprus. And so this is the Adri ship of Adramidium. We've got Cyprus. Um, and it they set sail off to the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia. Cilicia means overturn. Pamphylia is um, a nation made up of every tribe. Um, and then... Uh, uh, and then... Then they end up at Myra and Lycia here, but I won't write that, and you end up with bitterness. Um, so we've got lots going on in this history. We've got lots of lines telling us lots of, uh, lots of things. But I'm hoping when we look at the ship of Ad uh, Adramidium, what comes down um, in the application from 2021? Something comes down and something rises. Okay. So what comes down? Okay. Democracy. The USA comes down and what goes up? We win. But what does that look like? America as a dictator. Ruling the UN. USA dictatorship. Yeah. So I'm just trying to, I'm just seeing the lines sort of come together with the counter revolution failing. Um, I know we've got, I know we've got a dictatorship that we can see in 2016. We can see a dictatorship at 2019. There's so many lines that will point a dictatorship at 2016 with Ipsos. Well, the revolutions tell you 2019 is a dictatorship. 2021, you could even see a dictatorship here with the revolutions, with the rise of Napoleon, if you like. Uh, that's just coming to my mind. I'm sure there's other lines that tell us a dictatorship in 2021. But we also see a dictatorship in Sunday law. With Acts 27, there's dictatorship all, all along the way, and we should know now by Putin's, the way he's done it, every step of his regime, you can see him as a dictator. So this is no different. Um, but I just... Um, is there... What am I saying here? I've got a question. When does the counter-revolution die? Sunday law. So when does the USA become a dictatorship? Sunday law. What is an event that satisfies both? I'm not, I, I'm not saying I don't have answers here. I'm just... Um, so when you think what about was the question it, again? I'm just asked uh, this is more of a trigger for discussion not to answer anything all right when does the USA become when does the counter revolution die Sunday. Sunday law when does the USA become a dictatorship Sunday law they're ruler of the ten kings because it's um Panphilia, a nation made up of every tribe. Um, so what is an event that satisfies both of those? So the point here is, at Sunday law, is there a restraint from the king of the south? 
to stop this? No, because the King yeah. of the South is dead. Is there a restraint from the USA yeah. to stop no. that? No. So it's dead. So King of the South is dead. America's the... It's shipwrecked. So there's nothing to stop that from happening. And so the question is, we've got some waymarks here and a Sunday law, and I'll leave it at that. Question in the chat, Brendan. Oh, I haven't been looking at the chat. I apologise. Where is the chat? Okay. Um, I haven't really gone into these. So... I'm just going to go off the top of my head. I haven't written that down. Um, so do you remember the Biden administration? Remember, this is an information war. So um, so when you see Russia receiving a deadly wound, it's information war based. It's not wars and physical battles and bombs and this sort of stuff it's actually again it's no different to here it's an it's all about the narrative and who's controlling that narrative and the information controlling the information and who actually is believing that information okay so if you remember back in this history i haven't got dates in front of me but i'm just gonna and if someone if i'm not doing it correctly can someone uh, tell me um the Biden administration defeated Russia in this information space by preempting every move that Russians were making in intelligence. So they would make, remember, they took a risk and they made things public, like um, they're about to invade Ukraine and they preemptively told people. And so they stole the narrative and um, they made the intelligence um, um, public for everyone to see. And so they took the wind out of Putin, lost the, the control of the information. And uh, the big one was Russia was going to evade Ukraine. There's lots of other smaller things there. Um, as a result, Europe comes together, NATO unites, and most of the world sees Putin's Russia as the belligerent bad person. So Putin lost control of the narrative. And so Putin, everyone sees Russia as the bad. Yeah, and then sanctions and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, so that's my memory, and I'm, I might look at that myself just to verify. Has someone got anything else to add? Essentially, um, Brendan, King of the North won the the battle of information in that history in 2021. Yes, yes? Um, that was 2021. And the, the only thing I was going to add was I was actually thinking of this at the beginning of your presentation um, because uh, when you were talking about Bush and going into Iraq and the discussions and debate that continues over whether or not the government was given bad intelligence. It took the US intelligence community the entire period in between these two events to re-establish uh, re their reputation, regain the trust of both the US government and the international community to get to a point where they could assertively say this is what's going to happen and so there's the work that they've had to do in their own sort of space to get back to a point where they feel confident enough in their work but also listened to enough by the people that pay them to do their job to actually do that they took a risk didn't they um because Iraq burnt them. 
no one wants to believe them anymore because look at the misinformation that they caused back yeah. here to, and invaded somewhere. Now they're expecting their allies and the international community to rely on their intelligence again. Um, but they called it and every step of the way, there was other things as well. They called called it out. They, they preempted with, and made, by making the intelligence public and put, he was dead in the water. He had no, he had no moves except he invaded because, but everyone already knew, even though some of the allies didn't believe that they were going to, I think uh, Macron was one of them, but thank I you. Think for, even that, for a time, Zelensky sorry. didn't believe, I think for a time Zelensky didn't even believe him. It wasn't until the first 36 hours he was like, oh, yeah, no, that's spot on. So you're happy with that, Tinny? I think you've, I think you've said yes. So, um, But we're happy to look at that in a bit more detail as well. Um, that's a good question. We want to probably nail things like that just to remind us. Um, is anyone, I think I'll close with prayer. We're running out of, we're going a bit late. So if you could join me in a prayer, um, we'll close. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for um, your Sabbath day. We thank you for the lines yes. and we thank you for um, helping us with the leaders who help us to understand these things, who have presented these things, um, yes. who have given us these messages so we can try and sink our teeth into and understand and and for the purpose of understanding where we are and understanding what our obligations are. Um, we, we pray that you'll be with us now as we part and enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. We, we're just grateful that we can do this and come together. In Jesus' name, amen.